Um, how's the deck, by the way? It's finally done. Thank you for asking. Good, good. Send picks. I have a vague recollection of us of us talking about David sending us deck picks. Dream you had? Could could be could be a dream I had. Welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. And we are back with part two of reviewing our 2020 trends. An unexpected part two. Yes. <laughs> we, That's how it happened the first time. And The first episode took two parts. We thought this would take one, but it actually ended up taking two. So here's part two, a special holiday week edition of the Video Reformation podcast. So in-house has definitely, it, I don't think it went down. No, no. In in fact, what this I'm is seeing, an easy one to uh, another easy one, but worthy of prediction. And and I came into it thinking that that we were gonna like, you know, the hubris of us to to make predictions for 2020 and how dumb we were. I think what we see is a lot of these predictions we made were actually accelerated mm-hmm. by what happened. Maybe maybe slightly on a different path. Yeah, but, but but to some extent, because I mean, when you jump down to the next one, personalization. You, you can't, I mean, all the, the Go video and the video selling right. and, and the one-to-one, I mean. It wasn't scaled and personalized, but there was a hell of a lot of personalization. But that's what we talked about last year was was when we've talked about personalization in the past. It's about, like, making one video but making it so that on a certain platform it could be personalized mm-hmm. to, like, add their name or company name or whatever, yeah. right? And what we saw last year was that the idea of personalization, we'd been right over the last couple of years, but less so in that make one thing and then find through technology ways to make it appeal to a lot of individual people. Mm-hmm. What what we saw last year even was that it was moving more away from that and more to actual just one to one video. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so even if you take Zoom live conversation out of it, Mm -hmm. which is a big exception. The increase in asynchronous video, in video selling, again, just another thing that is was so accelerated this year, but was going more that direction anyway. And now all of a sudden you can't meet anyone in person anyway, so you might as well send them a video. Um, Another another type of personalization that I know has just gotten better as a result of technology listening to us and finding all these signals but like the the ads that i'm getting served are very personalized they'll even have my favorite nfl team Mm -hmm. or like it'll say durham in the ad and so they're finding like in the way in the ads that i'm being served um it's definitely been more personalized i know that's just a, a result of better technology well and and what's interesting uh that i've seen this week is is i chose to travel for Thanksgiving last week. And so I was in the DC area and this week I'm seeing Instagram ads for DC area things. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if the personalization has gotten more advanced, but I, I feel like I get when I go to visit my parents and while I'm there, I get those kinds of ads because it's like pinging current location, but it has now been a week you know, five days since I was there. And this morning I still got mm-hmm. laser like, tag ads. Yeah. I still got like, you know, DC singles, mm-hmm. uh, fed as an ad, which is fine. Cause you got to do something when I'm, I'm home visiting the parents, but like, you know, like it, it's, it was noticeable that like still a week later, it's, I think it's just processing the information mm-hmm. and like that location data differently. It's putting it into an, an algorithm as part of who I am as opposed to just pinging current location data. Yeah. And 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 kind of in creating that golden record of me. Mm-hmm. That golden record has some part where I do spend some of my time in the DC yeah. area as opposed to I happen to right now be in the DC area. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. Just touching back on the asynchronous video aspect of it. It's not exactly um, that same type of being uh, uh, personalized using data and and, and AI and everything, but I feel like we have started to leverage that more internally. And it's just interesting that even we are finding new ways to leverage technology and platforms that we already have and use to better service clients. Um, And the example being like, we started to send more client feedback using asynchronous video. Why do we do that? 
because I can send a video with our feedback on a, um, a cut of, of a video project we're working on and say, here's what we want to adjust here, here, and here. Take, watch this at your leisure when you have 10 minutes as opposed to having a to schedule a half an hour. Um, you can watch this on your own time, come up with your own feedback and put it directly into this. We use Frame.io, but um, if you prefer to have a meeting, we can still do that. If you'd rather just go ahead and put your notes in or just give us a thumbs up, great. And it's just, it, it's just a better, I think it improves the relationship. It's like, we're not taking up more time than we need to. Um, it, it's just, um, it makes our customer service that much better by using that. Mm -hmm. um, we've also used it in right ben you've sent asynchronous video to us i was just thinking about that and say we don't have a meeting for this you guys watch this when you have a couple minutes and just get back to me when you can i believe i was really uh, angry about something and wanted to get it off my chest instead of waiting for a 30 minute <laughs> meeting the next morning where i wouldn't be so angry i think that's right yeah yeah i sent a riveting one yesterday but, right through uh yeah. through uh slack yeah i think you moved your face in and out of your camera yeah. kind of that's what I recall. Of yeah, it. it was really short, but yeah, but you saw that I watched 100 percent of that I video, did. right? Yeah, yeah. More or more robust statistics and analytics. I didn't notice a whole lot. I didn't. Of, you did notice. I did not. You did not. Yeah. I yeah. I, I do think that um, as platforms like YouTube roll out new, you know, it seems like they're constantly coming up with a slightly different way to deliver ads using video. Um, and every time they do that, if you look on the back ends of, you know, the results of those, those ad campaigns, right. It has a different metric for that. So in that sense, I guess there's constantly this like slightly different data set that's being developed by somebody like a, by a platform like YouTube, where it's like, well, your ads that you use for, um, pre -roll mm -hmm. ad results the ads that you used uh, when you did the um, YouTube director or something, for example, had, had this result. Uh, and the ads that you did uh, unskippable had this result. So in that way, they're kind of constantly adjusting and, and expanding the kind of analytics that you have in that sense. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, it's difficult to say like how valuable that is at this stage, but I imagine um, a data analytics professional you know, someone who's super focused on that um, could find the nuances between those things and say, and, and, and extract some kind of an insight out of that. Um, well, I think YouTube specifically, because it is YouTube, uh, you know, they get to dictate almost what analytics they provide. Mm -hmm. Like they don't really care what anybody's looking for, but what, what I find interesting about YouTube, like on the insides of it, is that they've been relatively slow um, to, you know, I, I was going through a, a YouTube certification course last year and I was just surprised at, at, you know, like YouTube creator certification. And I was surprised at how like overt the language was that like they were, they were giving notes to new creators on how to create content <clears throat> that was either easily monetizable or were structured in a way that that they could place ads so that you as a creator could monetize that ad placement mm -hmm. also. And I think so much of their focus for so many years, you know, as you saw these YouTube creators blow up, like let's put our energy into getting more and more people creating content that can be monetized so that we can take our, and now I think I think they've been slow, but now what you're seeing is they're evolving less of that as like, how can we get content on our channel to advertise on? They've almost saturated that to a point that now the focus has to be what information can we give our advertisers so that they can understand what's working so they spend more money with us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'm just kind of surprised, but that it took as long as it did to shift to giving the advertisers the information because it was so much focused on, on developing YouTube as a channel where a lot of people would consume a bunch of stuff. They got to that point and then it almost took them like two years to then really switch over to give the advertisers the power as opposed to the creators the power. 
Um, you got to have the inventory. Yeah, yeah. It, I feel like and the data. I feel like the strange mistake that they made was they didn't anticipate that they would be able to build the inventory, mm. and so they didn't have anything in place. So that when they got there, that that's just what was. That's why, again, last year when I was kind of watching through this stuff, it was still so geared toward the creator, like making it so that they could. Like it was clear that their goal was, we need inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I was just surprised even last year that that was still their thing. But now you are seeing that more robust information. Whereas the like video hosting platforms, the enterprise level video hosting platforms. They've always just listened to their customers. It's not about advertising for them. It's about they're going to create their own content, and they need to know as much as they can know about how that stuff is used and shared and and all those kinds of things. So they've always been listening um, to and, and, you know, kind of the lines between creator and advertiser blur when you're talking about video content, Mm -hmm. you know, for business. You're... You're creating your own stuff that are yeah. essentially advertisements. So there's not a monetization in there, but so it's it's not quite apples to apples, but YouTube is its own beast. Okay, this is so entertainment oriented platforms publishing informational, educational business content. I don't think this was our intent, but I cannot get through this episode without asking David what happened to Quibi. <laughs> uh uh, wow. What happened to Quibi? Um, it was kind of doomed from conception um, because the concept itself didn't really make a ton of sense. Um, and what essentially happened was that the founders, Jeff Katzenberg and May Whitman, um, had enough power and influence and connections that they could raise a lot of money by hyping this thing that didn't really have a... a, a a solid uh, conceptual foundation from the start. Uh, so that's what they did. And they got people like Steven Spielberg and Jennifer Lopez and, and you name it to uh, agree to create content on this thing that effectively just f- the bottom fell out immediately. Now they initially blamed that on the pandemic. The whole point of Quibi was that while you're waiting in line at the grocery store, you can, or at the bus stop, you can watch a short Quibi show, um, a five minute quick bite. But when the pandemic hits and no one's actually going anywhere, everyone's watching Netflix and Hulu. They're not watching five minute short bites on their phone. Mm. I think that was kind of an excuse for something that people didn't really want in the first place. So imagine this for a second, if Quibi was super successful, what would stop Netflix from just being like, okay, well, we're just gonna make five minute shows. I, like, I don't know what... Netflix is not a like, mobile-first you know, platform. That's, it was built for mobile phones. And to give that's it, true, to make right? it more user... To give the user more power in how they view the show. Landscape, portrait. Right. But if you... If you were to, if Let's say Quibi really took off. Mm-hmm. Netflix could immediately be like, okay, we're just going to uh, heavily invest in our mobile-first... Our mobile optimization, which they're already doing. Um... Mm-hmm. And within a year, you're like, it, you don't really have any kind of competitive advantage. So I, I don't know. It just, it never quite made a lot of sense to me. And of course, the, the thing that really killed it immediately was that absolutely no one, I, I don't, I can't remember one show or one, um, whatever you want to call it, show, movie, quick content bite. series, <laughs> quick bite, that anyone liked uh, mm-hmm. or loved. <clears throat> what you really need when you're, Competing with HBO and Netflix and Hulu, you need something um, that's going to really stand out. You need your Game of Thrones or your House of Cards or um, sketch comedy, your, your handmade. Yeah, <laughs> sketch. You need I, something. Yeah, that's going to really think, stand out. Nothing. I think the yeah. I'm surprised they couldn't put together the programming to make this thing a success because <clears throat> I thought it was a fantastic idea. I I thought I, if I had six billion dollars to the give them for seed money, I would have done it too. Yeah, I. I don't know. I waffled on it all year. Um, I, to me, in retrospect, uh, you know, the term arrogance of abundance uh, kind of comes to mind. Like, if I think they'd still be around if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Um, I don't know that it that it was going to be like a game changer in how we consume content. Like the Segway was going to like change how we design cities. 
Um, but but I think given given the saturation in long form streaming stuff, I get the motivation. Um, I get the idea to say, look, everybody keeps putting out a long form um, streaming service. They all make a ton of money. Um, we're not. I mean, we could make a ton of money there, but why not offer the one thing that's an alternative, which is short mobile kind of stuff. And and I think they probably uh, could have succeeded longer to a point where they could have developed shows like that. Um, I do think it's amazing how many they people, how many like celebrities they roped into creating content. I have no idea how much that cost, what they gave away in terms of of stock options. I don't know how they did all that. But with all of the talent that they brought in to have a ton of content at launch, that it, it that it still just never it never grabbed anybody. Well, it's clear they they did not have a product market fit. Their market was young, like younger millennials and Gen Z. Yep. Especially with the mobile first platform, the product. The platform itself was great, but the product, the, the programming, the shows that were created aren't what that generation is watching. They're watching user-generated content like TikTok and YouTube. They're not. like And because and, and, that's short-form content, especially TikTok, there's all these bullshit part five series so that it does take five minutes to watch a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but people are more willing to watch. Like, they don't want to watch Jennifer Garner in a mini drama. They want to watch some hot guy flexes pecs and talk about beef jerky. I don't know. Right. No, Justin, that's exactly right. And when you consider the kind of content that you're watching on TikTok, when you're whatever you're doing in those in-between moments where you only have a couple minutes to kind of flip your phone, it's kind of stuff that you can turn your brain off and just sort of like, yes. right. And just like consume something that's kind of stupid or funny. Whereas like long form dramatic narrative or even, comedy or whatever does require you to pay attention. It's an investment. Yeah. It's an investment of your time and your mental energy and sort of your, um, you know, you know, you're investing in character, you're investing in story and right. And I mean, I'm not saying that a 15 minute story can't be powerful. I'm saying that like the user behavior and the times at which you're consuming that content are times when you're not, actively trying to really be super absorbed in a story for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's the occasional person who stands behind you in line at the store who's like reading a novel or whatever. But I mean, uh, I just think that there was a misunderstanding of sort of like their target consumers behavior and the way that people have already kind of been wired in the past, even just five years using their phones. I think they, um, I think they could have found more success if they simply chose the program for you. Mm-hmm. Instead of you having to decide, do I want to watch this? I don't know. The thumbnail looks stupid. Instead, they just mm-hmm. feed, they feed you something. And after a minute, if you want to keep watching, you can like go mm-hmm. watch it like IGTV. Or if you don't, you just scroll again. That, I mean, that format alone could have saved them. I, I It hadn't occurred to me until now, but, but I feel like Quibi is like the first Netflix season of Arrested Development. Oh, they did they did that very like binge watchy like they assumed that everyone was going to watch like all 13 episodes back to back so they basically had one 30 minute storyline and each episode they did from a different like mm. perspective mm-hmm. because they were going from broadcast television to the streaming platform mm-hmm. and it was like one of the first shows that transferred from broadcast tv to a streaming platform and that experiment despite the genius of Ron Howard and Brian Grazer, completely failed. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I feel like Quibi was that on a platform level. It's like, we feel yeah. like this should work. Like, there's this stuff and that has worked. We feel like this should work, so let's go all in on it. And it just didn't. Mm-hmm. There was that, um, their turnstile technology, which was like a, I don't know if they ever officially patented it or. Well, they tried like to. They tried to, and they, they were getting sued. And then they were getting sued. So it's like even the aspect of it that was sort of like had a patent, supposedly, that they could, you know, license out to other com- competitors, uh, potentially, you know, in the near future. I assume that was part of the idea. Uh, they were getting sued over like one of the aspects that was the most valuable thing to a mm-hmm. lot of investors saying, well, there's a proprietary technology involved, at least. 
Um, so there were, sounds like there were just a lot of problems. There's some, and Ben, I appreciate you giving me the platform to speak about it since you know I've read <laughs> probably a dozen different articles. I just know how but much you know about it. Yep. Yeah. But that's not uh, at all. No, it, no, it's not. But I really wanted to, to shoehorn Quibi into this conversation. And this felt like the, the closest we were going to get to It's an interesting it. story and one that has, I feel like, not really been discussed a whole lot, which is surprising because of uh, the intersection between entertainment and technology yeah. and, it, and having such grand vision and falling completely flat. We were yeah. supposed to have a show this year, too, that <laughs> yes. had not yeah. uh, gotten off to a great start. Um, Our investors are also pretty upset. Yes, uh, yes. That's because Justin keeps emailing them and saying, no, thanks, we're not interested. <laughs> um, so so what about the actual point on here from last year? Right. Entertainment-oriented platforms publishing info educational business content. I think the best way to relate this is look at uh, Apple TV as a entertainment-oriented platform. Okay. And they have a channel for masterclass. That's where you get better at something that is a skill or a trade. Okay. Um, we were thinking, okay, Netflix uh, might start producing content that helps people be a better writer mm -hmm. or be a better marketer or be a better manager. Um, I can't say I saw any of that content at mm -hmm. all. I'm surprised. And maybe entertainment platforms aren't the place that it's going to happen. It's probably going to happen on more business related platforms like LinkedIn because they're becoming. Well, and yeah, I mean, you know, Netflix and Apple TV are, aren't necessarily. So I think the apples to apples there is Netflix and Apple TV plus. Sure. The actual yeah. like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. content piece of Apple TV. Apple TV with a masterclass app is kind of like it's a device that has. You know, but a channel. Uh, that, that that has that channel. So, but but yeah, I think, I I think, it, it may have been a little bit pie in the sky. Um, I think there's certainly an audience for it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that anyone, and and I don't know how the big streamers make their decisions, but I don't know that anyone anybody would necessarily who isn't a Netflix subscriber would necessarily sign up for Netflix because now it had like a LinkedIn learning channel or a masterclass True, channel and that's or something their, like they're that. They're at an acquisition and retention. <laughs> yeah. And so, but you could make a retention argument there. I mean, if somebody kind of passively with uses all the, Netflix. With all the um, competition, yeah. the retention isn't important. Yeah. Um, I feel like one of the emerging platforms might be a good uh, pla like a place to do that because it offers something different. Yeah, I think, but I think you're right. I think there's a level between like LinkedIn Learning and Masterclass, where where it's it's specific enough, but it's like consumable enough where you don't have to commit like you know the Irishman amount of time <laughs> to getting through like learning what you want to learn. Mm -hmm. But but it's also like more specific than a lot of the masterclass stuff is mm -hmm. too, like like it has some of the specific tasks and and like better use cases that LinkedIn Learning has, but it does it in in you know thirty minute episodes or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that's maybe where that kind of Goldilocks spot is for that kind of content. But I, I would certainly. Um, I mean, I remember when I first signed up for Netflix, like watching like the Helvetica documentary. Mm -hmm. or, I right. I, yeah. I mean, there's there's that kind of content that that's there that that is just intriguing. But like from a, I mean, it's a little bit personal. But that was more of like a, you know, more of like a business use case. Design. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I. Like yeah, but yeah, I, I still think. In fact, I think I think maybe more now than I did last year. I think there is an opportunity for that, and and. If anybody had planned it, they would have released it this year because all of the streamers know that the people were spending more time on their platforms than they ever had before mm -hmm. by such a large margin. If they had something sitting in development, they would have cranked it through and put it out there. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can also I can totally see like Salesforce releasing an app on Apple TV that is essentially like their internally produced thought leadership content in series format or something, you know, like, like a huge B2B focused company, like launching their own sort of edu 
entertainment mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Stuff directly, right? Mm-hmm. Versus it being like acquired by another one of the yeah. one of the platforms. They yeah. could they could potentially just feed that to you directly if they did, wanted to. Yeah, Salesforce would be a great place to do that. Interesting, Justin. You should send them an email and see if we can. Okay. Hey, just Mark. Slack them. Maybe you can just Slack them now. Yeah. Didn't Salesforce Perfect. just buy Slack this week? Yeah, they invited everybody to a private Slack channel. Oh my god. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm really intrigued by by that idea. And again, I think with the stuff that got really with all the production of things that got put on hold this year, and all the like not ready shows that did get released on platforms. I think if they had anything like this, they would have done that. But I still think there's a, I still think there's a, a market for it. Mm-hmm. It's a small market. I don't know. I feel like the B two B segment is growing in popularity. Well, you know, and and I think that I think you could make a big work from home argument too. Yeah. That, I mean, you could go then like into your living room, you know, or the other side of your living room if that's where your home office is, and just you know turn on. I mean. I wouldn't mind my employees on the clock walk, watching that content. Yeah. It's right? an investment in your and, and so yeah, it's, it's easy for me growth. to say it's easy for me to say, yeah, um, I'll pay the fifteen dollar subscription for sales training. Yeah. And it's something that somebody made once and is scaling. I don't understand why that doesn't exist right now. Yeah. I do not. It's always it's always been a very personalized or, or one to one to few option to buy instead of a yeah. One to many. Yeah. Well, we don't have the bandwidth to do it right now. So if there's anybody who's listening who's got some money, yeah, um, go ahead and do that because there seems to be a market for it, according to us. We'll shoot it. Um, okay. On to, <laughs> on to our last little uh, little conversation of, of 2020 it's trends. It's a little too real. I know. But... What if there's a recession? It's also, but it's also paradoxical. Yeah. So what if there's a recession? Yeah. It's yeah. weird. The stock market investments went up. Sure. But the economy and is the shrinking. economy is shrinking. Yeah. Like dollars spent. Yeah. I, it's, well, and it's that, I mean, that paradox. the stock market isn't the economy. Yeah. Um, did you know that American Tobacco was one of the original 12 companies on the Dow Jones? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so... I think at this point last year, everybody was assuming that the worst thing that would happen in 2020 was a global recession. It happened. <laughs> lot. But it wasn't the worst thing. <laughs> it, wasn't the, it wasn't the worst thing, and it, and it happened a lot quicker than, uh, than I think people were thinking it was. It was the second or arguably third worst thing to happen in 2020. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the second worst being, of course, Quibi. Being canceled. <laughs> Being launched, uh, <laughs> pandemic, Quibi launch, recession. Um, I, you know, what we have here in the notes from last year are basically like if there's a recession, do video. Um, there was a global economic contraction. There was immediate change in how businesses operated, how employees worked, how money got spent. We've spent the rest of this episode talking about how people had to make different decisions, Mm -hmm. and a lot of those decisions went into video. When you add video selling Zoom into this conversation, which you should, because Zoom is a video for business use case. Live video platform, yeah. Um, If there's a recession, if everybody has to stay home, if there's a pandemic, like video is kind of the answer to all of those what ifs. Mm -hmm. And all of those what ifs happened, and people used more video. So, you know, pat on the back for getting it right. Um, but, but like, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about earlier, I feel like, um, I feel like, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's a word for this. Um, we do this like every episode. Um, I'm sure there's a word for this, but like, like once you cross the threshold, like now that video user, you know, usage has gotcha. kind of tipped a, a tipping point. Even if the economy starts to grow and vaccines work perfectly and everything goes back to the way it was, I don't think you'll see people stop using video. Yeah, I, I think this is one of those things where it was where this year ended up being a catalyst for video use in business that that reached a tipping point. That means that theoretically, there's only more and more opportunity for us and everyone who consumes this podcast 
going forward. It makes me intrigued. Yeah. I mean, if there's a silver lining to 2020, it's that we got this prediction right. Yeah. We totally so called the recession. We and our listeners as a community, we can, you know, walk a little bit taller today. Yeah, and, you know, David's got this cool, like, um, secret-based ability to just kind of throw things out into the universe, and they just happen. Um, so perhaps David's even responsible for the recession because— yeah, I probably should not have put pandemic on my vision board. <laughs> but I believe it's time to hear from our sponsor again. You haven't heard them crunching around right. in my pants? Yeah, that's what's squeaking. It's not your chair <laughs> that's been squeaking, chair. it's your people pads. People <laughs> All right, from the maker of puppy pads, come people pads. The world's first adult human diaper blanket. Never again do you have to choose between staying in bed and getting up in the middle of the night to relieve yourself. And for a limited time only, college students can use the code BLACKOUT at checkout to save 20%. But wait, there's more. Order now and you'll receive a free pup, pe- people pad pillow protector as a gift to you. Mm, for like Enjoy drool. same day sh- mm-hmm. Enjoy same day shipping when you order people pads from Walmart, Amazon, or Chewy. People pads, you're in control. I've I've heard that the biggest Black Friday movers are pajamas and people pads. That's what really sells That's right. on on Black Friday. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, like when Amazon sells, like, like people who bought this also bought this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the most common kind of pairing that they, yeah, that they see around this time. So. If you buy an adult onesie with a flap in the back but not a flap in the front, then people pads are for you. Interesting. I wonder if it just makes sense. I wonder if they'll turn this into a clothing line. Yeah, people pads. Clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, <laughs> okay. So, a uh, quick recap of the episode. Basically, we, were we right. perfectly predicted yeah. uh, what would happen in 2020. Everything in 2020. Um, give, uh, give a listen to the next episode because we're, we're going to go a little step further with our next episode. We're, we're not going to just identify 2021 trends. We're actually making bold predictions for 2021. So we're going to kind of uh, double down here and go from like, well, this is, you know, in our expert opinion, this is what's going to happen. No, 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 no. We're going big. All right. We're promising bold. We're promising bold predictions. David, would you like to be a part of that episode? I've got some cool stuff going on on my vision board over here that Mm. I really think you guys are going to like. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, Is one of them nuclear holocaust? We'll have, we'll have to wait and see. I don't want to give it away. <laughs> why does it have the Why does it have the date January nineteenth uh, attached to it? What's uh, What's going to happen the day before inauguration day? You got. It's called a tease, Ben. Uh, you got to listen to the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, all right. Well, then I think that is it for this episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. Thanks so much for listening, watching. Uh, we'd appreciate a like, like a subscribe, a download. In fact. I'm less worried about subscribes. I just love downloads. Download it. Delete it. Subscribe a lot of times. Download it again. It's an auto-download. Yes. Do a subscription. Do an auto-download. After it auto-downloads, delete it, and then, like, manually download. Huh. Well, David, what do you got going on the rest of the day? Anything deck-related? Um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to take those deck packs for you and uh, speaking send of, those. Speaking of deck packs, um, <laughs> can we go back to... Uh, your flexi pet guy eating um, beef, jerky? beef jerky? Yeah, let me show you. I'm subscribed to his channel.